I'd like to introduce Carlo Tagliano. He's a member of the Banksia Study Group and he's been a member since 2007. He's very passionate about promoting Banksia growing in suburban gardens. About 10 years ago, he set up the Banksia Lovers Facebook page, which now has about 20,000 members, which has become a great source of information. Carla, thank you. Okay, so I'm standing in for our study group leader, who is from WA, Kevin Collins, and I'm talking about Eastern Banksia cultivars. So, this first slide uh, was taken at La Perouse in Sydney South um, at New South Wales Golf Club. And it's probably about a 30 year old Banksy Serrata. It's not difficult to work out which way the wind's coming from. <laughs> and um, I guess it sets the theme for much of what I'll be talking about over the next 15, 20 minutes, um, how Mother Nature gets some of the Eastern Banksy species that quite often grow anywhere between two to three metres, even up to three or four metres high, get them down to knee level and keep them down. So this photo was taken at the Kamei Botany Bay National Park. You're looking at the passage of water coming into Botany Bay, same as what the Indigenous people would have had all this, all, the, all of this beauty would have been around them. Um, it would have been, you know, the, the, all of these low growing forms would have been present um, going back many centuries. Um, as long as these plants existed in this area, Mother Nature, the closer the plants get to the water's edge, the, the, the lower they are to the ground. So this is um, a, a dwarf form of Banksia ericofolia. There's some of the plants of ericofolia get down to basically flat level, uh, they don't get above the knees. And ericofolia is one species that gets to about three or four metres high normally. So in terms of the eastern species, I'll be talking a lot about the different forms of spinulosa, which is on the left, um, ericofolia and serrata. There's quite a lot of colour variation to in both the, the two side species, spinulosa and serrata. And a lot of these um, selected forms are grown by nurserymen um, when they find the dwarf forms that are more suited to growing in smaller gardens. I don't know whether too many of you come across from the West, but most of you, regardless, would recognise these are Western Banksias. Um, there's a greater percentage of uh, the members of the genus from the West compared to the East. And, um, you know, we're always very jealous of your species from the West. But um, we have beautiful Eastern species too. These are all Eastern species. Um, we've got um, on the bottom right, um, with the blue, the bluish centre of Longifolia. Um, we've got um, bottom left Plagiocarpa, top right Conferta from the, from the mountains. And so I, I don't think there is any average looking banks here. They're all beautiful in their own right. Um, the reason a lot of the banks here haven't really um, been uh, pushed um, in terms of dwarf varieties from the west Generally speaking, um, a lot of the Western species are quite difficult to grow from cuttings compared to the Eastern species. I mean, Banksy's are difficult to grow from cuttings anyway. So um, they, the Law Fitz Nursery in WA has sold a lot of low forms of um, Western species, but they haven't really developed them into cultivars. They've just called them low growing forms or dwarf forms. They haven't really given them any name. Um, but um, the eastern species um, are a little bit easier to grow from cuttings and selected types are taken from different headlands up and down the coast, particularly in Victoria and, and New South Wales. Um, so um, the trouble with trying to grow some of these um, from seed, the, you just don't get reliable forms. You can get semi, semi low growing forms, you can get upright forms and you don't know really what you're gonna get until the plant develops. So seed is not the go. So when growing banks, here's just some basic information. If you're growing from seed or if you're growing from a tube stock or you buy a plant from a nursery, start pruning straight away. Prune as early as you can to get as much branching, the more branching, the more flowers. With most banks, here's, um, unless you've got a low growing form uh, that naturally stays more compact and low to the ground, a lot of banks can get quite tall and lanky. 
in their 15 year life cycle, they'll become very leggy and all the foliage will end up at the top and you'll be a bit disappointed. To create more vigor, to create more, uh, more of a healthy plant, prune early uh, and the plant just bites back against the pruning. I guess the same goes for a lot of proteasy. To grow pregnant banks here successfully, you need to have good drainage. Apart from a handful of species that don't mind wet feet, they really need to have uh, a well-drained bed or be growing on a slope where the water can flow away. They adore the sun. Healthier plants uh, will exist in the sun. If you grow them in shade, they're not going to flower very well and they'll be more pest prone. And like a lot of proteaceae, avoid fertilisers. Uh, the proteoid roots are very sensitive to the phosphorus and, and um, uh, they, they suffer that phosphorus toxicity if you if you use fertilisers. This is a low growing form of oblongifolia. I think I might have mentioned before, oblongifolia normally has a blue centre, but this one has a pinkish centre. And oblongifolia normally gets to about two or three metres uh, high, uh, fairly open branching habit. But this form from um, a section of the coast up near southwest rocks in New South Wales stays quite low to the ground. Um, it's not just the, the uh, plant that uh, is, it has stunted growth. The, the flower heads tend to be a bit shorter. The leaves tend to be a little bit shorter. But it's, it, it's, it's a plant that, unfortunately, the cuttings are, have been proven quite difficult to strike. And it would be a shame if we couldn't get this one commercially available. But I'm growing this one in my garden and, and I'm hoping one day that it'll be more readily available. So which Branxias can we grow? Um, we all know about Banksia birthday candles. It's been flogged off for many years in the nurseries and um, they keep churning it out every year. Um, and um, people buy them and they plant them. Sometimes they plant them when they're in flower to bring some Christmas cheer and the plant's already expending a lot of energy at the time it's flowering. The plant has to undergo the shock of being planted while it's in flower and quite often the flowers fade, the plant dies and then they the same person will go back to the nursery in November or December and buy another birthday candles to replace the one that died. So my tip is always to try and uh, wait for the flowers to um, expend their uh, energy and cut the flower heads off and then plant after um, flowering. Uh, birthday candles is a little bit unreliable in flowering. It's sort of been known to flower on alternate years and it's not all that floriferous, even though they managed to get it looking like that at the nursery. Um, this is, these are mass plantings at the uh, National Botanical Gardens in Canberra. So obviously we can't do this in our, our suburban gardens, but it has a beautiful effect. Um, closely related to birthday candles, also um, originating from Ulladulla, just uh, a little further south from here is cherry candles. I think a much better cultivar to grow. It's more reliable in flower. It, um, and it grows about the same size. This plant growing in my garden is about 12 years old. And it, look, it grows bigger than the dimensions the horticultural tag will tell you. It, it's about a metre and a half to two metres wide. But um, yeah, if, if, um, if I was to pick one, I'd say cherry candles would be one of the top three Banksy cultivars to have a go at growing. The uh, styles are more of a cherry red colour, as you can see from that photo. Coastal cushion is slightly larger. It all comes from the same um, area at Ulladulla. Uh, it was originally collected by um, Neil Marriott and it grows to two metres wide, a little bit higher than birthday candles and cherry candles. And the one unusual thing about this plant is that it flowers quite well in southern Queensland. Unfortunately, a lot of the Queenslanders that want to grow our eastern cultivars from New South Wales, Victoria, they can grow them, but they can't get them to flower. Something to do with the humidity, I'm not too sure, but this one does flower in Queensland. And it's got more of a burgundy coloured style coastal cushion. Because Spinulisa has such a variety in colours. Um, you can pick the colour you like or the combination of colours you like and, if, if, and then, and then plant, plant it out. Um, uh, a low form of Spinulosa uh, bush candles has been developed by the Illawarra Gravillia Botanic Garden for several years and the, the styles age from burgundy to black. 
So again, this is an area that had mass plantings of um, bush candles. So you wouldn't do this in your, in your garden. People would think it's slightly sort of off the planet. And <laughs> it's nice to have a bit of variety. I mean, the birds would love it. Uh, Banksia honey pots is beautiful too. You can see the honey color in the flowers. Very attractive. It's actually a, um, a, a cultivar of Banksia calina, which is very close to Spinulosa. Our coastal Banksia, Banksia integrifolia, seen here growing at Malabar Headland, which is just a little bit north of the um, Kamei Botany Bay National Park. It's uh, a very important species in terms of being the rootstock for, rootstock for many of the our grafted um, species. Banksia integrifolia normally grows as an upright tree, uh, 12 to 15 metres. And this is at the same area of the National Park, but it's back off the headland. You can see how a tree can get quite upright when it's away from the fierce winds. But normally um, when you get right to the water's edge, it's chopped down very low and, and the fierce winds keep it, keep it pruned down. And it's a genetic trait that's taken no matter where you grow that plant. So there's been a, a cultivar around for many years known as Banksia roller coaster, which is an integrifolia form. And um, this picture was taken down at uh, Cranbourne in Victoria, the botanical gardens down there. Very good at um, protecting it against, against soil erosion. So this is another shot on a golf course because I play golf and my mates often give me a ribbing from having my little moments with my Banksia serrata, stopping and I catch up to them and I say, I'll, I'll, I'll catch up. And so I, I, this is a, a good example of what Banksia serrata would normally grow like multi-branched. Uh, it's growing here on an ancient sand dune at Bonnie Dune Golf Club, um, which originally would have been the Eastern Suburbs Banksia Scrub, which is a critically endangered uh, community. Um, there are many different colour forms of Banksia serrata, um, which is an added bonus. And I'm sure all the people from the West are really jealous right now. <laughs> but, you know. Um, so this form of Banksia serrata. Again, this picture was taken at Cranbourne Botanical Gardens is called Pygmy Possum. I think these forms of Banksia serrata, remember it grows as a sort of a large shrub tree to four, four to five metres, sometimes even larger. These um, low forms, almost flat forms, ankle high, I think come from the very far south coast of New South Wales, somewhere maybe down near Eden, I'm not too sure exactly where. Banksia amula, which is closely related to um, Banksia serrata. There are some low forms, because Banksia amula is sort of more multi-branched. It doesn't usually always get quite as big as serrata. Um, these, there's one metre, 1.2 metre forms growing at Awabakal Nature Reserve. We're looking north there towards Newcastle, Port Stephens. This is a photo of Banksia ericofolia, one of our eastern Banksias. Um, I think when you look at Banksias closely and you look not just at the flower head, but you look more closely into the flower head, it's really nice when you can see the, the change in colour um, from one colour to the next. And it, one thing that we appreciate about Banksias is the change in colour from the bud stage to the final flower stage. Um, it can happen very slowly, but it's really makes you, it reminds you of how nature, perfect nature can be to see um, the colours inside the, inside the flower. And this is a low form of Banksia ericofolia, Little Eric. I'm sure many of you would love to have that in your garden. Banksia ericofolia, um, when the sun hits them, probably compared to most species that I can think of in, within the genus, they, they really display a strong iridescence and they really glow in the sun and it's so easy for the birds to see these flowers from afar. Uh, a more upright form of ericofolia that I've grown that I really like is called bronze dozzy. And um, it has this trait I find quite often of having multiple um, heads. Um, so. That's an interesting feature. It grows about two or three metres high and it has honey coloured pistils. It's quite an attractive form. If you see it in the nursery, I'd grab it or grab it for a friend. 
In terms of threats to Banksias, and this would apply not just to Eastern Banksias, but Banksias in general, um, for the last 15, 20 years, as an example, we've had um, development pressure at um, Catherine Hill Bay on the central coast of New South Wales. And there's probably countless examples of where dwarf forms of Banksia spinulosa and other species um, occupy prime real estate where there's um, pressure from developers to have um, areas of headland cleared. Um, the special thing about Catherine Hill Bay is the spinulosa there um, comes in many different colour forms. So there's a bit of genetic diversity. There's yellow styles, the red, orange, burgundy, black, all in the one area. And um, I think this is the area that um, Banksia um, stumpy gold came from that was developed from this area. So just to summarise some of the threats, um, obviously we've got development, as I've just mentioned, um, changing water tables, heavy rains can affect some species. Like I said, apart from maybe just two or three species like Robor, Oblongifolia and our tropical Banksia, Banksia dentata, most of the Banksias don't like to have wet feet. Um, they're used to the water. They do like water Banksias, but they need the water to keep draining away. So when you plant, you need to raise your beds to give them a chance. You can't put them directly on clay or maybe consider planting them on a slope where the water can continue to flow away. Um, climate change is obviously an issue because um, with um, increasing temperatures, some plants are so stressed they don't go into flower, they don't have the energy, or they might have very short and flowering seasons that don't overlap this strain on, the, on their pollinators. Um, so it reduces the chance for um, plants to uh, reproduce and, and regenerate and store seed. Um, water quality, salinity is an issue. Um, burning regiments, how often fires come along is important. There are a lot of banksies that are killed by fire, but they produce fruiting cones that rely on fires, fires to release their seeds. So um, a lot of banksies take at least three or four years to mature enough to have a flower and, and also produce seed before that next fire comes along. So if we get two fires in close succession, it can wipe out an entire small population of a particular species in a national park or, or in a particular area. There are some straight species that actually occur in a very limited distribution in WA. If a fire comes through, it can make those, um, it can risk extinction of that species. That's why grafting becomes so important um, to preserve material. Um, yeah, so, um, and obviously fragmentation, others have spoken about this before, land clearing, corridor uh, thinning, um, a lot of the, um, broken um, flora corridors um, allow weeds to jump in. The animals don't feel safe. Um, there's just constant pressure when, um, you know, seedlings develop. If if um, there's lots of weeds around it, it really makes it hard for the, for the seedlings to establish. If there's a drought, the seedlings can't establish. You know, it's just, it's just all, a little bit of a mess at times. Uh, Phytophthora applies more to um, the Western species, but there are some Eastern species that can die from Phytophthora too. So, so just a final thought, you know, if you don't have any Banksia growing in your garden, maybe consider uh, planting um, a Banksia. The birds um, love the Banksias and um, at a time of year where there's not too much in flower, a lot of the uh, Banksias are autumn flowering, so it's, it provides an important source of nectar for some of the um, bird species. This is a photo taken by one of the members of our um, Banksia lovers group who does a lot of photography down at Cranbourne. So this little wattle bird is really loving it down there. He does a lot of bird photography in the, in the botanical gardens down there. And just um, the Banksia study group, we have a couple of hundred members. Um, it's an email group, uh, a couple of newsletters a year go out. We're looking for more members, uh, more contributions. Um, and we've got the Banksia Lovers Group page, which also is a, a good source of information to a lot of people share photos, ask questions. We have many experts on the page that uh, can provide advice to people um, starting out. That's the end of it. So. Thank you. Thank you.
If you enjoyed this presentation, then please subscribe to our channel. Other presentations from the conference are available in this playlist, with new ones being added all the time.